Hello, and welcome to the Business of Story. I'm your host, Park Howell, and author of Brand Bewitchery, which will guide you through using the Story Cycle system to craft spell-binding stories for your brand, business, marketing, sales, and leadership. You can grab your copy right now at Amazon or Apple Books. But it's only effective if you can refine your messages down to a singular narrative, so you're not confusing your audiences and customers with a bunch of competing storylines. I mean, simplicity rules in storytelling. So today, this episode is like one long story marketing moment, because we are going to teach you how to use the foundational narrative framework of the ABT to win with your business storytelling every time. The word narrative I define in my Houston book is the series of events that occur in the search for the solution to a problem. Once you absorb that definition for narrative, you begin to see it underpins everything that we do. It's at the core of argumentation, logic, reason, debate, storytelling, script writing, novel writing, comedy, and the scientific method. Randy Olson is a Harvard PhD evolutionary biologist turned filmmaker who has written five books to help the science community communicate better using proven storytelling techniques. His latest book is The Narrative Gym. It's a short guide that you should have at your side whenever you are structuring your stories or your messaging. I've been using and teaching the ABT, the and, but, and therefore narrative framework in all of my sales training, brand building, and leadership coaching work. And I count Randy as one of my greatest friends and mentors in the storytelling world. So please welcome to the business of story, Randy Olson. Randy Olson, welcome back to the show. Fifth time. What the hell? <laughs> the guest who won't go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just, it's just the story is just the oddest thing because it brought us together, what, seven years ago uh, when you wrote your book, Connection. And that's when I first was introduced to the ABT and what you revealed about that. And, and it's, it hit me from a brander as it just gets to the core truth of any sort of communication with this problem solution dynamic. And so you and I have become fast friends since then. And while you've been developing it, you've allowed me to, to drop in from the peanut gallery and say, hey, have you thought about this and check out that? So it's been fun to be on this road with you on the ABT. Uh, it's been a ball. And you've, you've been not just a, <clears throat> a rider, but you've actually been a driver of the bus at times. Uh, you've contributed major chunks of our understanding. And it's been a journey because there was no, and but therefore ABT template a decade ago. I derived it from what I'd heard from the South Park guys saying in a documentary, I think they had learned it from a famous screenwriting instructor, Frank Danielle in the 1980s. And from there, we began making it up as we went along and developing this thing and hitting all these moments of realization. We have a team of about a dozen people now with the course that I'm running that all of us are constantly, we're doing conference calls after every session. And along the way, you have pinpointed a bunch of different things over and over again. And as you know, you're a fundamental part of this course now. And there are several scientists in the course who have learned principles from you and the business world. And that has been really a tremendous experience because one of the big problems we've developed in our society now is the silos where everybody's off in their own little discipline and they don't even know how to talk across disciplines. And the idea that in this course now, we not only have all these scientists, we have you from the business world, we have Brian Palermo from the improv acting world, the Groundlings Improv Comedy Theater. We have Patty Limerick from the world of history, a former MacArthur fellow. Uh, and we just have a whole variety of other folks from different disciplines. And we all have this common bridge, which is this ABT structure. Yeah. And you have been working, you un uncovered the ABT and been working on it for about a decade. And you have taught several thousands of scientists and academics and engineers, very, very smart people about you know narrative structure and how to use this. But 2020 really opened a whole new door to learning on the ABT. Right when you slash we thought we had this dialed in, we learned so much more 
from teaching it over and over and over again through COVID. So would you take us through the, you are an evolutionary biologist turned filmmaker and now have written five books helping the science world learn. What? Let, let, let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the ABT and where you took it from 10 years ago to where we are today. Yeah, it all began in a single moment in uh, November 2011, where I was watching Comedy Central and they did a half hour documentary called Six Days to Air about the making of the animated series South Park. And of course, it featured the two co-creators, Matt Stone and Trey Parker. And what they'd hit a point by then, 15 years of that show, where the, the technology got in the animation to where they can put out or put together an episode in just six days. So that's what they did was this fun little thing following these guys start to finish on a single episode. And right in the middle of it, Trey Parker said this very simple thing. He said, here comes the point every week where we get the first draft of the script, 45 pages. Then I sit down and use what I call my rule of replacing. I go through the script. And every time I see the word and, I ask myself, could I replace that and with either a but or therefore? Every time you can replace an and with a but or a therefore, the storytelling gets better. When I heard that simple little statement, I just about fell out of my chair because I'd been through USC cinema school. I'd had at least five writing courses over the years, and I had never heard anyone describe story structure in such incredibly simple terms. But if there's one thing I knew from my science background, it's the power of simplicity. That's how you reach big, broad things that can unify people. So I set to work asking friends, have you ever heard of this simple rule? And they all said, no, but it makes total sense. It seems to underpin the basic structure of the hero's journey that is the central tool we use for telling stories. Then I began researching it deeper and realizing it connects all the way back to the philosophers of the 1700s who broke down uh, basically thinking into three elements, um, agreement, contradiction, and consequence. And the more you research that, you realize how universal this these three forces are. So I pr presented it in a TED Med Talk in 2013, put it into our book Connection in 2014, I believe. That's when you came across it. And then in 2015, I wrote kind of like the, the main book of the five that I've done in some ways. Um, Houston, we have a narrative published by University of Chicago Press. And in there, I really laid it out in detail and sort of in a lot of academic detail in some ways, a little too much. It's hard for kind of the broader audience to delve into that book. But at the end of that book, I sketched out the idea that this tool is so powerful. And what we all need is to not just memorize these three words and but therefore but actually absorb these three forces and understand how they work in our world, agreement, contradiction, and consequence, and work with it so much that the ABT is just a tool to help you develop the feeling for those forces. And that's the way you eventually get to be a really effective communicator is when you can feel agreement, you can feel the contradiction, you can feel the consequence, you can feel that we don't have enough agreement going here yet, we're, so nobody's listening to each other, so we got to work on that. You can feel that there's not enough contradiction. We've lost the narrative. It's contradiction that drives the whole narrative process. And you can feel that we're not talking consequence. We're just sitting here rambling all over the place. You know, it's time for the word therefore. Therefore, what are we doing? What are we talking about here? So those three forces become so powerful in communication. And I sketched out this idea of a training program called Story Circles, with the idea that you would mostly build this around five individuals getting together because another one of the things we began to realize is that you can't do this by yourself. It really doesn't work to sit at your desk and try and come up with good narrative. You've got to have other humans listening to it and helping you develop it. It's the same thing that exists in the Hollywood studio system. They all have development departments in these different movie companies where they develop scripts over time and they work in groups with them shaping the narrative. And that's the basic uh, skill to try and train people in is how to shape narrative because narrative always starts off kind of flat and lacking texture and structure. And it's in the revisions that you begin to shape it and actually get a form. And just like a sculptor, basically, you've got a big glob of clay in the beginning. You've got to work with it over and over again to get actually the form out of it. So this at the simplest of all levels was a training program and it was built around the idea of in-person training. So there were two parts to it. The first part was the demo day where you pulled together about 40 people into a room for a whole day and everybody would learn what the actual training would involve. 
And then out of those 40 people, people would sign up and then you start to form the actual circles, which would be five people. And those, some of those circles met in conference rooms. Some of them met through more and more through Zoom and already through the internet before the pandemic came along. So we were already kind of thinking in those terms of a training program that was largely ba based on online uh, mm -hmm. techniques. And then last year when the pandemic hit, we had our final demo day in Hawaii with the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, 40 scientists there. And we were booked for the whole year, uh, but then by March, everything had to be canceled. I took a one month fun vacation of swimming and playing tennis, surfing and playing tennis and thinking, wow, this is gonna be the rest of my life. And then I got bored. Uh, and then last April, started talking to the people in our group. And actually I was out surfing with a buddy of mine who works in child behavior. And he was proudly telling me about the, uh, the course that he was gonna pull together online. I hadn't even thought about this. And as he was describing his course, all the bells were going off in my head like, wow, I can do the same thing. I can do the same thing. And I literally <laughs> caught a wave. I said, hey, man, I'll see you later. Rode this wave all the way to the beach, ran home, called up everybody in our group, said, hey, we need to do a course. And that was on a Friday. We whipped it together over the weekend. On Monday, we announced it on Twitter. And by that Friday, it filled all 50 slots. Uh, I think a hundred bucks a person, yeah. 10, one hour that's, sessions. And that's how it's it amazing. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing. And before we go into that course, because you and I and the team have learned so much in the process of literally teaching hundreds of scientists over the course of 2020, uh, national park service folks and whatever, but let's give uh, our listeners a, a couple examples of an ABT. I have the simplest ABT I work with everywhere. And I just say, most executives communicate and care, but bore. Therefore, tell a story. <laughs> and But it's not a story in and of itself, but it uses story structure of setup and that statement of agreement, the contradiction, then the conflict, but you're boring unless, you know, if you're leading with data and just droning on and on, therefore, tell an emotionally packed story to hook through the hearts, you know, hook through the noise, hack through the noise and hook into the hearts of your customers. There you go. Uh, one of the dynamics we've learned about the, the in communication in general is that concision brings with it strength. When you can boil the message down into short, punchy little words and phrases, you can feel the strength of it. And one of my favorite ABTs was uh, one of the demo days we did at University of Wisconsin with a whole bunch of fish and wildlife folks. And the scientists in general tend to, when they write their ABTs, that the mistake they make is too much information. They end up with these lengthy, cumbersome things that they read aloud and they go on and on. They really don't motivate anybody. So that day we had a contest and I forgot what the prize was, but at the end of the day, each table picked their favorite ABT and they read it to the whole group of 40 people. And they were all kind of, oh, that's interesting, interesting. And then finally this woman got up and that they work a lot with fish weirs or kind of traps they put out there in the field. And her ABT was, we've been using fish weirs for, for over a hundred years and they do work, but they suck. Therefore, we need a new way to get <laughs> fish. And when she said, but they suck, the room just exploded after all these long-winded ABTs previous to that. <laughs> and you got to see in a single moment, the power of brevity. And that's what you see in the advertising world, you know, is boiling these slogans down to something, you know, just do it. That can just grab that moment and when you get it there to the short, punchy thing, you see the whole crowd just light up. That's really fun. And the funny thing about that, too, is it brings out the humanity in their communication, doesn't it? Versus trying to sound smart and logical and reasonable. You know, when you get when you can get it down to that point. Now, that may not show up in any big report, but it sure is a great place to start if you are the author of that, because it gets you super focused on something that you talk about a lot is this singular narrative and how the ABT helps you get to the singular narrative. What is the singular narrative and why do you think it's important, Randy? It's where the whole narrative process begins. Um, the singular narrative, the, the ABT is these three forces. Agreement is what it begins with. The word and is the most common word of agreement. So we begin effective communication with, here's all the things we can agree upon. And that's fine until after a while, we've got too many things start to get boring. And it's like you watch a murder mystery. And if it goes on too long before we get to the dead body, you're going to just change the channel. So there's an optimum length where you've told us enough. And then you got to start the narrative process. And the narrative process begins on the word, but it begins on the contradiction. So we've laid out all these things. Now we're going to go in an opposite direction. Here's a dead body. Suddenly we've upset the world. And it happens that instantaneously. And as a result, that's the most important moment. And one of the things we've learned this year 
was that in developing this course that we've done over and over again now, we're now in the ninth, 10th, and 11th rounds, that we do this exercise called the ABT build. And what I do is I have each person in the course, they get their, each person gets five minutes in front of the course where we read their one sentence ABT to start with. Then I start in kind of not criticizing it, just analytically using all these rules to show them how to strengthen it. Um, what if we do this? What if we do that? Look, your piece you've got here in the butt actually should be in the end, all these sorts of suggestions. And with time, they start to pick this up. Well, we've done probably getting close to 300 of those ABT builds now over the past year. And as we've done that over and over again, all the the dozen or so instructors working on this course with me, we begin to see these patterns like, wow, you know what? Over and over again, it seems like you begin by going right to the butt. You, you seem to just jump. And then we began to realize, wait, I think that's a fundamental rule here. So that's step one of the model we've developed, which is you begin by diving right into the butt and you ask this simple question of what's the problem you're working on. And one of the things I like to do in that technique is to ask the person, tell me what the problem is in five words or less. And you hear, you know, the person kind of just locks up like, well, five words. Yes, come on, you can do it. <laughs> and the way you do it is you leave out the information. So you don't tell us that this is about, you know, development of vaccines involved. This, that. That's all the information. You leave that out. You just say, a uh, hundred years and still no effective technique. Um, something like that. You know, you, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know the context. We only know the story, which is this is a story about frustration after a hundred years or who knows what. So that's your story. And you're focused on the problem. You are absolutely focused on the problem you're out to solve. That's it. And the problem is at the core of your story. And so that's what you get with those five words. It, the only way you can get it down to five words, you got to dump all the information out of there. Um, you know, one of the standard ones that comes out on a lot of them, uh, everything in moderation. That's a story that we don't know what kind, what world that's from, you know, the context. We just know that that is uh, one of these age old stories. So you start with that problem. Then once you've got the problem, then you can go backwards to the end material, your setup. And that problem now tells you exactly how much setup you want to do and what you want in the setup. One of the problems that arise a lot is people just throw a whole bunch of information in that, the and, and, and stuff. Just here's a bunch of stuff about my topic. I know, but we only want things that are really crucial, essential to getting to the problem. Then once you've got, so that's step two. So step one, you go right to the butt. Step two, you work on the setup. And then step three is once you got those things put together, then the most important part of your entire ABT are the two turns. So you've got a turn on the word, but you get this moment where you grab everybody's attention, but here's a problem. And then you got the second turn on the word, therefore, where you're going to deliver the solution. And you want those two moments to be as powerful as possible, because those are your two chances to actually break through the noise of our world and grab somebody's attention right in that moment if you do it well. And that's the whole model, those three parts. And it's funny because when you show it to people and you get it a lot more, maybe in your line of work with the big thinkers in the science and engineering worlds is, and I've heard this too, that people have said it's too simple. It can't possibly work. It's reductive and insulting, actually. You know, you're not allowing me to show my brilliance. And it's just the quite opposite. It's you are trying to take the complex and simplify it down to this problem solution dynamic. You talk about simplicity discrimination. What's that? That's the long-term battle I'm engaged in with the academic world. So I came from the academic world. I did my PhD at Harvard. I spent more than enough time around hardcore intellectuals, and I have a world of respect for them, but they're terrible at communication. And they, they're so bad they won't even admit it. Um, and they feel that the solution to communication is through psychology and sociology. And if we do enough studies and we put together enough theories and everything else like that, and it's just well known, you know, academics can't communicate their way out of a paper bag, especially in the science world. So I wrote my first book, Don't Be Such a Scientist, in 2009, because I had left a tenured professorship as a marine biology professor and gone to film school in search of a better understanding of communication. And I got it there in film school and in the films that I've made over the years and eventually began to circle back to the science world. So I made a series of films for about 15 years. Then in 2009, wrote this first book, Don't Be Such a Scientist. And this is what I'd learned partly from filmmaking, more importantly, through the acting courses that I took, which is that academics overcomplicate everything. They think and they think and they think and they think 
And the next thing you know, they've got a whole pile of spaghetti there that they're very proud of, but it's non-functional. And they are the bane of a lot of the problems in our society with this overthinking. And unfortunately, the Democratic Party, more than anybody else, buys into a lot of it. And the next thing you know, they've got a bunch of gobbledygook. And there's a super important study that came out two years ago from a group of, of researchers in Denmark and language folks. They took a third, over a third of a million speeches from around the world, political speeches, and analyzed them. And the title of their study, you can find it online, is Liberals Lecture, Conservatives Com Communicate. And therein lies so much of the problem of the last four years. We got a president who was a very powerful and effective communicator and a pile of liberals who sat there lecturing the world about why this is so terrible, but couldn't get their message across to anybody. And they're their own worst enemy. And it all kind of has its anchor in the center of the academic world with this belief in all these complicated theories and ideas. And every once in a while, a complicated theory and idea comes along to explain stuff, and it is really good. But for the most part, we're just drowning in a world of too much complexity. And the consequence is really poor communication. And they just don't have the ability to pull their heads out of it and see these things. And as a result, they feel that the real strength in, in our society is to look at how complicated everything is and leave things intact and in, intact and enjoy all the nuance and subtlety and everything like that, which is fine for art appreciation and things of that sort, but it does not work when it comes to the real world of communication. And it has real world consequences, which is you can't reach the masses. And that's, again, what we've been dealing with. I, I got to say one side political note. I think I'm seeing tiny signs in the Biden administration. Somebody in his speech writing team has got a pretty good grasp on some simple dynamics, much better than a lot of previous Democrats. So there might be some hope going forward, but it all really needs to begin with them reading that study and, and just soaking in that title. Liberals lecture, conservatives communicate. That's not me saying it. That's a huge study for, of, of over a third of a million speeches. And therein lies the problem. And so the result is you come up with something that's powerful and simple like the ABT framework. And the first thing you get are academics just stomping on it, particularly a lot of um, professors of journalism and even communication, some of them, they're just constantly saying, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. You've bumped into it. You did a workshop where what was said to you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That lady, after taking them through it, it was their head of IT, who was a very, very sharp individual. And she looked at me and she crossed her arms and she flopped back in her chair and she was totally mean mugging me to the point that I actually stopped the workshop and said, Cindy, what is it? This ABT thing. Yes. It's reductive and insulting. And I think it comes back to that thing of I can't show my brilliance through all of my big words and my complexity if you boil it down to this simple setup problem resolution dynamic. And I'm going, wow, okay, I get that. And you and I, I sent you a note right after that, and you just started laughing. You goes, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard that from the science community. And I'm, I don't hear it often anymore because I think people are really going, wow. Yeah, they're living complex lives, and well, they are taking in all this information. They can't do it anymore. When you can boil it down and demonstrate it to them, they go, yes, this know, works. So jump back to that story I told about at the University of Wisconsin of that woman reading her ABT saying, fish weirs are good, and we've used them for 100 years, but they suck, and the whole <laughs> crowd explodes. Imagine as the laughter and cheering dies down, that woman being there saying, well, that you should not listen to her. That's reductive and insulting. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it worked. Everybody got the message and they were moved by it. Oh, God. It's just and they will never forget her. They will never forget yeah. that little moment that she delivered that ABT That's in it. a very human way. And, you know, I don't know if I ever relayed this to you, but I had a parallel experience, which is without naming any names, a Pulitzer Prize winner tweeted at me when on one of my blog posts about looking at the communication dynamics of Donald Trump and pointing out the core ABT dynamic that he has an intuitive feel for. And this particular fellow, you know, put out a tweet and said, I have lost patience with your hyper reductive approaches and blah, 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 on and on like that. Just, you know, insults. And what are you supposed to do? I thought the guy was my friend. And I look at that like, well, what's your problem? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just don't think it will work. But let me ask you this because I am no evolutionary biologist, but I, I've bounced this question off you a couple of times. I try to boil it down to like, 
why does our human animal monkey brain like this dynamic so well? And you and I have seen it now for a decade in action and how powerful it is. For instance, Randy, last week I've been working with a big sales team in healthcare and the lady said, I've been trying to reach this prospect, this administrator at this hospital for 10 months, never ever even acknowledged one of my emails. And then I sent her an ABT last week. And within two hours, I had a virtual session and I go, do you think it was just coincidence? Just get lucky? She goes, no, that's the only thing I did differently. And because of that, I think I just made it easy for her to consume and said, yeah, you know, that is a problem. And, oh, you've got a solution. Let's, let's talk about it. Then you can get into that more complex conversation when you're in selling, you know, the features and functions. But my question is, is this a survival technique in that we are running with this problem solution dynamic in the back of our brain and our limbic system saying, should I run from Randy right now? Should I fight Randy right now? Or is there actually maybe an opportunity in this? And therefore, we don't want it to be complex because we have to make a snap judgment. Am yeah. I in, is okay, this okay. a threat or not? Yeah, no. You see, you're already doing what academics do. You're already taking <laughs> the level of complexity because you're getting into the fight or flight, all that exciting stuff. Ooh, maybe this is about yeah. cortisol. Maybe this is about uh, oxytocin. Maybe blah, 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 blah. No, keep it back at problem solution. And think about this basic dynamic of problem solution what does every lizard on the planet do every morning when it gets up? It faces the problem of how am I going to feed myself? How am I going to reproduce? And its brain goes to work on solving those problems, problem solution. Every creature faces this fundamental dynamic of problem solution. It's, it's just ultimately primal. And it's at the core of everything that we do. And, you know, this is why we sit and play games and all that sort of stuff. Our brain at the simplest of all levels is nothing more than a problem solution machine that is desperately seeking problems and then loves solving these things. Now you can begin to move it up to more complicated levels of how problem solution dynamics radiate and this other stuff. But the fact is, this is the way I just define the word narrative. Uh, the word narrative I define in my Houston book is the series of events that occur in the search for the solution to a problem. Once you absorb that definition for narrative, you begin to see it underpins everything that we do. It's at the core of argumentation, logic, reason, debate, storytelling, script writing, novel writing, comedy, and the scientific method. All of those things at their core are about problem solution dynamics. Every great story ever told was a problem solution dynamic. Every major blockbuster movie that ever appealed to a, both in space and time, every story that ever radiated across the planet and every story that's persisted for hundreds and thousands of years, they've all got the problem solution dynamic at their core. So the more that you can try and bring things back to that primal uh, that, and that's what the ABT does. It brings you back that primal, because that's all it is. The three elements, and but therefore, are set up, problem, solution. It's that simple. It's that simple. So it has been evolving in your world, too, and we have seen so much of it happen with this course. Let's talk a little bit about the course that we've all been participating in, in over 2020 and what you have learned um, from both your scientific mind and your storytelling mind and how you've seen this evolve. We've all learned tons together. It, <clears throat> it's a tremendous course. It's 10 one-hour sessions. We're now, in the month of February, we're now expanding out to three concurrent sessions because it become demand has now exceeded supply. And in fact, Brian Palermo, uh, who's worked with me for 10 years, is a comic um, improv instructor and, and actor. And he's now going to be teaching one of the three sessions sections. And then we got a whole bunch booked through the spring. But, and he's with the he's with the famous Groundlings. So this is he's like legit stand up yeah. improv guy. And you have also brought on some celebs through Groundlings to be a part of the program or to or to share some insights on storytelling. Yeah, we, we've had some great people. We had a whole string of three folks from HBO that were in the last round of the course or two rounds ago, uh, including Cheryl Hines, who plays Larry David's wife on Curb Your Enthusiasm, who's uh, one of Brian's good buddies. She's a uh, uh, improv. Uh, actor. And the course began in last April. As I say, we're now in rounds uh, 9, 10, and 11 that are going to be running simultaneously in February. And with each, each, most, each of the previous rounds have been one month duration. So it's 10 one-hour sessions, usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But what it's meant is that 
when we were doing story circles, it was really just episodic, just spasmodic. We'd go and do a demo day and then we wouldn't see each other for another six months and do another demo day. With the course, we're all getting together online every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then every session, when it finishes, we have a conference call 15 minutes after the hour of the dozen or so of us, or everybody that's present, usually like five or six people that are there for every session. And we get on that conference call and we just talk about what went on that hour. And it's in those co conversations that usually have, last a half hour to an hour that we begin to synthesize. You know what? Did you hear that today, today when that person did their ABT build and they, you know, you put that and that together? Oh my goodness, I think that's a pattern. So it's been an incubator. It hasn't just been a course that we've done over and over again. It's been building on itself as we've unearthed this, this three-step model, which didn't begin to emerge until about the fourth round of it. We began to see these patterns. You know what? Every time you seem to begin by going right to the problem, that maybe is a first step. So we built and built and built. And then by last fall, I ended up writing a book titled The Narrative Gym. That's a super short book. I love how short it is, 75 pages and costs you six bucks on Amazon. And it's the real book that you want to have sitting on your, your desk as you're trying to shape the narrative of something because it's so simple and just gets right down to the, the bare bones. And now we've got the benefit of the new people taking the course now can get the book and read it in like it takes you one to two hours to read it. And they've already got that. So we're now starting the course at a more advanced level by everybody coming in the door already knowing the basics of the ABT. And it just keeps getting to be more and more fun. Well, and you've added a little bit to the structure sometimes. So, uh, and one of the the innovations I like is in the statement of agreement after the end when you are introducing the stakes, what's at stake, and why this is important. You've got this if then thing that has popped in, and I've used it in the branding world to great effect. It's very helpful. Can you take us through that thinking a little bit? It's unbelievably powerful. It, it cropped up a year ago. Uh, a woman named Marissa Metz, who was doing her PhD at Colorado State University in the biomedical program, and she was working on opioids and opioid addiction. And we, she just contacted me and said, could you help me with the three chapters of my dissertation that I'm writing now? And I asked her to do the ABT for each chapter. And one of them, she, it was about, um, we need to figure out each for each neuron, is it involved with pleasure or pain? And then I just started in with, you know, why? why? Well, and she was like, well, everybody knows why you want to know if a neuron's involved with pleasure or pain. No, everybody doesn't know that. And even your fellow scientists, it'll help them if you can explain that. And it was in that moment that I, I said, you know what, why don't you try phrasing it in these terms? If we can figure out for each neuron, if it's involved with pleasure or pain, then, in fact, that was the question I put to her. If you figure that out, then what does well, that mean? She said, oh God, well, yeah, if we get that figured out, then we can do this, 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 this. And then I said, there it is. That's the goal. That's how you sell proposals is that you go through that. If then, if you will give us the money to do this, then look at all the great things we can do. And that's, you put that into right at the end of the end material there before you get to the butt. Or conversely, you can use it in a negative direction in the butt. You can say, but if we don't do this soon, then the whole world's going to fall to pieces. And that also motivates people. But that if, if then clause, uh, once we started putting that to use and within this content, within this framework, the structure of the ABT, and you can see exactly where to put it in there, the results are, tr are tremendous, as you say. Yeah, and it's you don't have to use it every time. Sometimes it doesn't work for you. But if you find yourself, it just but, seems to strengthen but. it. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. I want this, and it's important because of this, but I don't have it because of this. Therefore, I'm going to do this. I mean, is what it is. You know, I want this, and if I can get it, then it's going to be like awesome over here, but I don't have it because of this. And the crazy thing is that as you work with this stuff, you begin to get hypersensitized, those three words. You begin to hear them and what's being talked about. You begin to use them all over the place. And one of the most important things I'm up to my neck in right now that everybody's welcome to know about um, one of the top epidemiologists in our country is Dr. Michael Osterholm, the director of the Center for Dis Infectious Disease at the University of Minnesota. And he's been on Biden's advisory board. Um, he contacted me last October to see if I could help him. He's on TV every other day. You, you know, I'm sure you've seen him on some of these on Meet the Press. In fact, he'll be on Meet the Press tomorrow. And now I'm up to my neck in every day working with him, shaping the narrative and teaching him these things. And our conversations now are just packed full of and but therefore, you know, what's what's going to be the but? You know, okay, if that's the but, then all right, what's the therefore? What's this all coming together? And it's really fun because I help him shape this stuff. And then I get to turn on my TV and hear what we put together come out across the airwaves. 
but there is there's one of the first major endorsements I've got from somebody high up in back in the academic world who gets it. Um, unfortunately, the major science organizations and a lot of them just in the foundation, things like that, they've got their own way of doing everything. They really want this complicated psychology stuff and they just they've discriminated. That gets back to that term, simplicity, discrimination. And one thing to add to that whole separate story. Well, the best episode to date that I've done with you was the one that we did the morning after Trump was elected. And I told you in detail about the collaboration I developed with James Carville, the Democratic Party strategist, longtime strategist. And in my discussions with him, he told me his personal stories about simplicity discrimination. That was his greatest attribute. He's the guy who ran Bill Clinton's campaign with George Stephanopoulos. And he came up with the famous um, little catchphrase of it's the economy, stupid. And that was a modification of keep it simple, stupid. And over the years, you know, he told me these stories of these corporations that hire him and they give him 30 volumes of all of their reports and everything. And they say, you know, we want you to summarize it. And he comes back with one paragraph and they go, we gave you all this money. This is all you're giving us back is one paragraph. Yes, that's what you want. That one paragraph, that's all you need. I found the core narrative of what you guys have been, you know, wandering all around the place with. And it's just people can't buy. Well, we gave you this money. Don't we get 30 volumes back? No, you get one paragraph. It's this simplicity discrimination thing. It's really difficult, but it's so important. And if you doubt it, just take a look at the past president and the strength that he had of simplifying things down for better or worse. And he was uh, the, the ultimate uh, contra. What do you? What am I trying to say? The ultimate contradiction guy. Uh, he really was. Yeah. yeah he, he lives and breathes contradiction. Here's one of my favorite little anecdotes on that was um, right after he got elected. Um, it's a tradition, you know, every year that the president shows up at the Army Navy football game and goes into the booth in the third quarter and chit chats with the commentators. So he, you know, it was like two or three weeks after he'd been elected. And there he was. And I was watching the Army Navy game and he comes in the booth and they're talking to him. They're talking about what a beautiful sunny day and everything like is so great, you know, and everything's positive, positive, positive. And then he can't help himself. He finally says, uh, yeah, it's a nice day, but let's be honest here. These aren't the best two teams in the country. And there's this <laughs> silence. You hear the two commentators like, "What? why do you have to point that out? You know, this is supposed to be a day of praising the armed forces for their football. He can't help himself. That guy will never be, he would never be happy with world peace. You know, he's. Yeah the contradictionist. He's driven by narrative. He's driven by the butt. And that's the way it goes. <laughs> a contradictionist. The word I was scrambling for was contrarian. contrarian. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. yeah, but, <laughs> exactly. yeah, but. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you, you know, and, and by the way, I did a panel discussion with some neurophysiologists a couple of years ago at a university. And one of them said, you know, most of us think that your whole brain is nothing more than a dopamine addiction machine that all, everything you do all day long, is just to make little squirts of dopamine into your brain. And then he said, I, I got a feeling, you know, work on your ABT thing enough. You'll find out that that's what the word butt does. Releases a little squirt of dopamine into the brain. That's why everybody wants this contradiction. That's why we watch these exciting stories. <laughs> Randy, I want to share with you an example that you've seen, but I'll share it with the listeners of how we use it in the branding world. And we do this too when Randy brings me in to work with these scientists because I'm the outside guy. I'm the, a lot of them are sitting there rolling their eyes going, oh, you know, here comes the scam artist, business guy, business communications has no place in you, science, you blah, blah, blah. That. Used car salesman. Used car salesman. And, you know, my point is, hey, if you're trying to get funding for a program, you are selling. If you are trying to get your people to buy into an initiative, you are selling. So you can learn a lot from the business world, the marketing world, branding world on how to do just that. And so we share a lot of different examples of how you place. The other thing, real quick, what I like about the ABT is it makes you place your audience at the center of the story, telling it from their perspective. So I was doing a workshop for a large cargo company and they sell straps and cables and whatever you need to strap down and secure that uh, cargo on your semi-trailer. So I went to one of their landing pages and, you know, it's pretty romantic, Randy. It's flatbed trailer cargo securement. Let me quickly read their lead-in copy here. 
We are the cargo control people, and we are here to help truckers and fleets alike get back control of their cargo. Give us a tie-down problem, and we'll give you the ideal solution to make the securement job a smooth and effortless process, from straps to winches to ropes to hooks to blah, 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 blah. And so I said, all right, so let's just apply the ABT to this. You know, what everything I've learned from Randy and the science world and evolution and how this works, let's rewrite it from the trucker's perspective, or maybe even more, more importantly, the CFO from the trucking company's perspective. It says, your cargo is gold and it's critical to ship it as safely as possible. But there are many potholes along the road to a successful delivery. Therefore... Secure your valuable load with the straps, winches, ropes, and hooks from the cargo control people at, and I'll leave the name out because I think I'm on NDA with them, but I can share that ABT with you. And I got to tell you, this was a virtual uh, sales training I was doing with them. And I got a holy shit out of the head of sales when I got done with that. He's like, whoa, can you just write the rest of our website? So this was just after teaching them about the ABT over the course of you know 20 minutes, have them working on a couple and then showing it in an action. And his team immediately saw the power of that singular, simple narrative from your audience perspective, but with the problem right there before they even talk about themselves as a brand because they are the solution. Amazing. <laughs> <Ta-da>. <laughs> yeah, not the least bit surprising. And one of the most amazing things in, in the course, I mean, first off, we're horrible to you. Um, we, took, <laughs> we took a picture of Kurt Russell from the movie Used Cars and Photoshop Park's face over Kurt Russell's face. <laughs> so we that's our first image we show Park is as a used car salesman because there is this cultural divide. Scientists are trained from day one to be suspicious of people from the business world. And I mean, it really becomes something in the fabric of being a scientist. You just look at business people like, oh, they're whores and prostitutes, basically, and that they have no faith. Um, they, they have no allegiance to the truth, really. And there's a lot of truth to that. You know, I've, I've lived two careers. I was a scientist. Scientists are, to their credit, the most honest people in our society, pretty much. I mean, they're driven by these honesty principles. Then I left there and went to Hollywood. And Hollywood is the slimiest, scummiest place <laughs> in the world where you're laughed at if you're honest. You know, you're just stupid. You're not meant to be a filmmaker if you're honest. I mean, they, they taught us in film school how to steal film from <laughs> companies, and things like <laughs> how to steal images, how to steal everything. Um, so there are these cultural divides that happen. And science versus business has got that divide. But... What happened was early on, the very first round of the course, I pulled together these dozen people and they began to listen to the other pre presentations. You know, I'll, I'll just listen to see what this person's saying. And Park talked about a couple things in the very first presentation he gave, which was that dynamic you mentioned right there. The idea that you're not the hero, it's your, your customer who's the hero and you're just the guide or the mentor there to help out the, the customer on their journey. And when he gave that bit of his presentation, one of my long-term buddies, Diana Padilla, who was an undergraduate with me a long time ago and is a big professor at Stony Brook University um, and marine biologist, she heard that and instantly said, that's just like writing a research proposal. It's the same thing. Over the years, she's been a reviewer for the National Science Foundation, you know, one-year position with them uh, in D.C. And she said the, the proposals that work year after year are the people that have that ability to tell a narrative in their proposal about the whole science community, that they're the heroes, they're all in this big journey. And by the way, I hope to make a little contribution here as a, as a guide and mentor with this project I'm doing. And that psychology ends up having an impact on the, the people's opinion of it. So she ended up absorbing that. And then we began to have her give a presentation following yours, where she shows all these science people, they're so skeptical and they, they probably don't hear much of what Park says, even still when he comes on because he's business guy, business guy. But then what they get is Diana coming on the next presentation saying, look, you've got to be less literal minded. You have to understand there are people outside your discipline that have gems of knowledge that you can benefit from. And this is an example right here. Look at what Park's saying. And then the other uh, element we have that we don't have time to go through, but the narrative spiral, which he also presented in his presentation. And then Dr. Nancy Knowlton, member of the National Academy of Sciences, same thing. She heard that and said that applies to the entire large scale history of the American environmental movement. So she now gives one of the last presentations in the course in which she uses Park's model of the narrative spiral and applies that to the American environmental movement. And again, seeing these bridges between disciplines are so important. And that's, you know, everybody's, we're so polarized now, we can't figure out how, 
this is how you talk across these divides is through this ABT dynamic. And we're getting there bit by bit. You know, it's me versus the academic world. They put up every barrier possible. It's not that simple. But then you get out to the practical, or like, for example, the National Park Service. I mean, we've we've got huge partnership with them now. We've probably done this course four times with them, and we've booked for a whole bunch throughout the rest of the year. They get it. They're down there working with the public. That's a lot of what the problem is. Are you way up in the ivory tower in which you can look down on the stuff? Or are you actually out there in the real world working with the public? And if you are, you probably get it. Yeah. And folks, when Randy mentions the narrative spiral, he's talking about the story cycle system that you're all very well aware of if you follow the show, but they have sort of deemed it this narrative spiral because it grows as it, in every revolution, it expands and it expands engagement. It progresses of an, an initiative forward and so forth. So we have now, and then Parker just did a wonderful animation of it for me. And he calls it the uh, story cyclone. Here, dad, here's your story cycle. <laughs> so the story cycle system is taking on a life all its own. <laughs> hey, Randy, you've got your new book out, and it's kind of like the strunk and white of writing, but this is the strunk and white of story structure called The Narrative Gym. And I've always said that the story or the ABT is your storytelling dumbbell. It's the very first thing that I teach in all of my work. And I say, folks, use it in everything. Use it in your email writing, in your presentation writing. Just curl that thing every single day because it builds that narrative intuition of problem solution dynamic. And you will start seeing the world a little bit differently in how you communicate and connect with it. Where can they find out more about you and your new book? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Just Amazon, you know, Randy Olson, The Narrative Gym. I think that takes you there. And then what's our website? Um, NarrativeGym.com. Um, do we have a <laughs> 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 of course, you know, that I'm just don't have time to do a lot. Of stuff. You do. Um, yeah. But we'll yeah. have it in the show links. Yeah. I think, uh, I think there's a narrative gym.com website. There is the narrative gym.com. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Evolutionary biologist, Randy Olson has created the ABT and it has revolutionized communication as we know it today but he doesn't remember his own website. <laughs> Therefore, go to narrativegym.com. You can get the book. You can find it on Amazon. Oh, and I have it. You can read it in, like you say, one or two hours, but it's just a great little reference tool to go back when you are fighting through an ABT and just looking at some structure, all kinds of great models in there and yeah, illustrations and of how to use it. That three-step model, you know, that's what's yeah. come out of the course. And everybody should try and absorb that because that's where you – and this is all stuff that you, you do before you do anything else. Before you launch a big project, before you write a big article, before you give a big presentation, this is step one. Sit down and map out your narrative using this three-step uh, model. What's my problem? And one of the things that, that happens in our ABT build exercise, endlessly, I ask people, okay, now tell me what your problem is. And they begin to realize, well, we, we've got about four problems here. No, that's not going to work. You want the singular narrative. You got to pick one problem. And there's always that book we cite, The One Thing from back in 2012 that was a bestseller. That's your challenge, especially with scientists that are in love with all their information. And they, you know, I've got 18 things I need. No, if you tell 18 things, nobody's going to get anything. You got to get the one thing, namely, you know, I hate, hate to say this, but it's just like what that president figured out with Make America Great Again. He had his one little unifying thing that he stuck to start to finish. And that's how we work narratively is that you search for that one singular narrative that can pull everything together. Yeah. Well, Randy, thanks. For coming back on the show, I'm already planning appearance number six. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> enough already. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great book, folks. Get it. And Randy, thanks. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you, Park. And for all your contributions. And, you know, this is not hype. This is not something I'm concocting just to make him sound, feel good or something like that. Um, he's been a really central part of advancing the knowledge. And among many things, you're the first guy that spotted the ABT structure of the Gettysburg Address. He called me up one day and said, you know, I don't know if you noticed this most famous speech in the entire history of this country. It's nothing more than ABT. There's three paragraphs. First one's the and one, second one's but, third, third one's therefore. Ken Burns did an entire hour-long documentary on it, never even mentioned this feature of it. Um, people, it's going to take time for people to spot these things and absorb it, but we're on this journey, and you are one of the central characters on the journey. So thank you so much, Park. Well, I appreciate that. I have learned so much from your cast of characters that help pull off the whole program. And, and two, you are doing, um, 
opens now, right? That you don't have to be a part of a particular organization to take advantage of this training uh, or yeah, how is on. that working? Yeah. Hang on in that. Do we, I got to back that, walk well, that back? We did the first two rounds last year were open and then we didn't have time to do it until just this January. There was a gap, but now we're booked for the next few months. All these organizations all want the course. So we're just too swamped with all that. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, maybe yeah. around May or something like that, we'll do another open one and then people can, um, it's like 200 bucks and you can do the course. But for now, it was just a backlog of all these big um, organizations that all want to yeah. do. Yeah. Well, down the road, if uh, we get to the point that we can do some more opens, folks, it's so worth doing. Uh, it will completely revolutionize your communication. It'll make you a more confident and compelling communicator through this simple little story structure that is reductive and insulting to some, and but <laughs> therefore, but it is the single most powerful tool I have ever learned in my 35 years in branding and in, in, in advertising. And actually, the one thing I will add on is if you've got an organization that thinks they want to book all 30 slots, um, that's what we're open to. And, and yeah. yeah, get in touch with me for that. Uh, Randy Olson Productions at gmail.com. You remember that one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <You did. laughs> <laughs> all right, Randy, and thank you all for listening to this edition of the Business of Story. If you like what you heard, of course, share it with your friends, family, colleagues, bosses, anybody who is boring you to death with their emails. Have them listen to this. It'll just completely revolutionize them and you. If I can be of help to you, visit me over at businessofstory.com. And uh, if you haven't yet gotten my book, Brand Bewitchery, grab a copy now on Amazon, Apple Books. And we have been continuing our Build a Better Brand Story Sprint that can help you craft your brand story within just three weeks, six live sessions. And I promise you the ABT is at the heart of this course too, because if you've got a brand, you've got a business, you are in the problem solving business. And that's what we do is help you really identify what problem you solve for more you know, better and more distinctively than anybody else, who you are for, and then how do you actually communicate that to the world using the ABT and everything from strategy to finding your theme to how you actually communicate it. So let me know if I can help you there. Join us next week when we will have another amazing story artist or maybe almost as amazing as the fifth time, Randy Olson. Okay. Uh, remember that <laughs> time. <laughs> got to be number six next week. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to hold off a couple months till we have you back. <laughs> but remember, folks, that the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.